Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 205. My name is Aryo ben Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a word of prayer. Avinu, Malkenu, our Father, our King. Thank you, Lord, once again for this time that we can spend together, for uh, the opportunity to pour through your words and to allow the Spirit to instruct us and to guide us and to equip us for um, matters related to holiness and for this assignment that we have of um, being your ambassadors here on this earth. Help us, Lord, to uh, continue to um, turn from sin and turn into righteousness so that our vessels can be usable. Help us to continue to to um, affirm our first love, Yeshua, and to allow his um, words to pour through us, to cleanse us, to, to, to make us um, uh, uh, in, into the, the people that you know we are. Uh, indeed, it's not self-effort that's turning us into the people that uh, we are. Uh, it's your Holy Spirit. It's your words of life. It's the reality that uh, Yeshua accomplished on the cross. Lord, that's who we truly are. And so that's something that we ourselves cannot accomplish. So we, re- we rely on him. We trust in him. But at the same time, we have this responsibility in and of ourselves. It's not automatic. And so thank you, Lord, for the assignment of holiness, for the, the, the struggle that holiness represents, that this daily uh, sanctification process of, of um, saying no to my flesh and saying yes to the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that uh, challenge and for the fruit that it yields. May you receive the glory and the, and the power and the praise uh, for, for all that is accomplished in my life. Bless us, Lord, during this time. Um, um, bring to my recollection the things that I studied this week, and I pray that the students would have a, um, a, a blessed time as well. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. B'shem Yeshua. Amen. All right. This is another live internet studies, um, uh, uh, live internet studies study. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi, and the study is broken up into two segments. The first segment is 30, I'm sorry, is uh, an hour long. It used to be 30 minutes long, but now it's an hour long. And it is a study on end time prophecy. It's called, um, S eschatology a study of a biblical study of end time events and the second 30 minute study is a uh, apologetics uh, study on um a topic called a trinitarian response to biblical unitarianism where we look at verses and passages and concepts related to trinity versus unitarian um uh beliefs in the bible and things like that so i hope you can stick around for the for both uh, sections but this is uh the first segment um, where we're talking about eschatology and end time events. And as you can see on my screen right now, this is the kind of the rough, uh, schedule that I'm going to be following. Uh, I've got 14 different topics, like you can, topics, like you can see on my screen right now. We're already through topic one and two. We're now ready to turn headlong into topic three, key scripture passages where we're going to be, uh, looking at, as I can ascertain some of the places in the Bible that we absolutely need to be at least somewhat familiar with. Um, I'm not saying you have to memorize them, but it's a good idea to have them um, under your belt so that when you're studying end time prophecies, particularly events related to future events coming up, you know, events in the future, um, that we can have a better grasp on them. And the Bible gives us plenty of, of uh, topics that we're going to be seeing here in a moment. But as you can see, there's a lot of um, material to, that we're going to cover in this particular study. I don't know how long it'll be. Uh, I originally planned it to be maybe three or four months long. It could go longer. I, I'm not planning on dragging this out for an entire year, but just bear with me. Uh, we'll go through each topic as, as needed. And I'm working up to actually topic 11 and 12, where it says Book of Revelation overview and then letting Scripture interpret Scripture. This is actually a study on the Book of Revelation. But in order to get there, we have to work through the key passages between topic 3 and topic 11. Uh, Daniel's uh, prophecies, um, the topics such as the rapture, um, Mystery Babylon, uh, all of the discourse. Um, And the only way to do that is to go through um, a lot of Old Testament prophecies that talk about this uh, future time period that uh, still awaits us, if indeed that's your perspective. So we're getting there. And then as you can see on topic 13 and 14, um, we'll talk about addressing questions and answers. I don't know what that's going to look like just yet, so just bear with me. All right, let's jump right into um, key scriptural passages. What I've done is um, I've created a... uh, Give me a second. Why is my 
it's not moving there we go i've created a um these are just word documents that i put together and, and made available not yet available to you guys but they're available on my side if you do need them and you desperately need them um in order to follow along right into me go to my website at tatetor.com click on any of my commentaries and scroll to the very bottom and check my email or click on the about rel and you can see my email there and um uh, send in a request and say hey i need the notes and I'll, I'll send you what you're looking at on the screen but otherwise it's not available online anywhere so key scriptural passages what i broke this down into is first some general passages of importance and then we're going to look at some specific chapters of importance uh this will not be done in one week um this will go at least easily two or three weeks as we look through some of these passages we're not going to read all the passages but i just want to make make you aware of them Maybe you can um, uh, write them down or take a snapshot on your screen or, like I said, write into me and I'll send you the document. All right. Here's some key scriptural general passages of importance. Prophetic teaching is scattered throughout the Bible. If you've read the Bible from cover to cover, you'll know what I'm talking about. There are, however, certain passages that I say are basic if one wants to grasp an understanding of the return of Mashiach. Right. So we're really working towards this idea that Jesus is going to return to planet Earth. If you want to break that down into what we might call the rapture versus the second coming, where the first part of that deals with Yeshua um, snatching us away from the uh, tribulational time period, whether you think it's going to be before anything bad happens or in the middle of that bad stuff happening or at the very end. We'll talk about about those different options, but we're still talking about an aspect of Jesus um, snatching us away and meeting him in the air. That's one part of the second coming. There's another part that authors often refer to as the second coming itself, where um, Jesus' feet actually touch down on planet Earth. In other words, we don't meet him in the air. We actually return with him to fight against the um, uh, armies of Satan and the Antichrist and things like that. The Battle of Armageddon, you guys have probably heard about all that. So we're really talking about working towards an understanding of the return of Messiah, generally speaking. Um, And that's why I talk about prophecy uh, leaning in that direction. We're not talking about prophecies about his first coming so much as we're talking about looking at the Bible for end time prophecies, right? Second coming prophecies and um, uh, things like that. So... It's a no-brainer that the first one on my list is the prophecies of Daniel. We we kind of did teaser fashion last week. Go back and listen to show episode number 204, where I give you like a kind of a sneak preview teaser trailer, if you want to call it that, use modern terminology. Um, Daniel's prophecies, particularly in chapters 2, 7, if you want to throw in chapter 8 there, that's fine too, but I don't think so much in time there, but 2, 7, 9, and then 11 and 12 are all of particular interest. So here's what my notes say. Of particular importance is the 70 weeks of Daniel recorded in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, right? That's really kind of like um, one of the key passages related to the last kind of final um, uh, concentrated seven years on planet Earth. Um, this passage gives us the general time frame for the fulfillment of of Hashem's plan of the ages from Daniel's time forward. It identifies when the 70 weeks, remember we talked about this giant swath of history of Israel that may or may not include this gap known as the times of Gentiles. I believe that it does include the gap. I'll show you a little chart in a moment just to refresh your memory. Um, But it identifies when the 70 weeks begins, what will happen during the 70th week, and what will happen after the completion of the 70th week. All of that is part of Daniel's um, prophecies uh, all concentrated into the chapter 9, 24 to 27 verses. Uh, it also informs us of some critical information that will take place during the final 70th week, which, according to most uh, prophecy stu- uh, teachers and students, is a seven year duration. Seven years, not on our normal calendar that we would think seven um, uh, solar years like with 365 days year, uh, days year, but rather um, most Bible students are of the uh, consensus, me included, that the biblical year is 360 days, 12 months of 30 days each. So it's, it's more of a lunar calendar than it is a, a solar calendar. In, in reality, it's a lunar solar calendar. They both work together to keep the seasons where they need to be. But prophetically, when we're looking at prophecy, we're talking about um, 30 day months 
and 360 day years. So if we're talking about seven years, uh, Daniel talks about 1260 days and and three and a half years, and and he, and so he he gives us um, uh, numbers that helps us correspond to a, a, a seven year. Uh, time frame. Again, I'll flash a little chart on the screen here in a moment. When one realizes that 69 of those weeks have already transpired, so a lot of Daniel's prophecy already came true. Where it, Remember, it started, depending on what, if you start in chapter 2 of Daniel or start in chapter 7 of Daniel, there were two visions. One was given to the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and it was a statue, that's chapter 2. And then one was given to Daniel a few chapters later in chapter 7, where it was four beasts. They both overlay nicely with one another they're both talking about the same historical time frame but um um one was like a more of a broad picture one of us a little bit more narrow picture but by the time we get to john and we look at certain beasts and 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 uh uh, key players in the end times, then uh, John is given a, even a bigger picture. He's 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 given like a, a more detail, um, and so we begin to realize that this giant 490 year time frame of 70 weeks, a lot of that time has already uh, come and gone because the statue in in uh, uh, Daniel chapter two started with the king of Babylon at the time. Right, that was Nebuchadnezzar way back in the sixth century BC. So fourth, fifth, sixth century. So we're not talking about events that were we're not looking at the entire 49, 490 years to transpire ahead of us. A lot of it is ancient history: Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. These are um, kingdoms that have kind of come and gone, um, and so that's why I think that's the best way to view uh, this part of the of Daniel's prophecy. So they've already transpired. It's more than interesting to note, I say, that the world is rushing towards that day in the future when Mashiach will return and history as we know it will conclude. So let's jump to some of those those charts again for a split second, just so you can see. In Daniel 9, starting in verse 27 and reading through the end of the chapter, you can see it pulled up on my screen right now. Um, most Bible, uh, most Bible uh, versions even labeled as 70 weeks in the Messiah. So um, Daniel's praying for insight into what's going to take place. And the focus is that what the angel shows him is something that is going to be definitely a part of his people, i.e. The, uh, the people of Israel, or you can say the Jewish people, and the city of Jerusalem, which has been sacked by the Babylonians, and the temple, which is the set, the heart of of um, worship and the heart of um, of uh, community life in Jerusalem. So when it talks about in the very first verse about this 70 weeks being decreed for your people, that's the people of Israel, your holy city, that's Jerusalem, to finish the wrongdoing, right? Remember, Israel's in judgment. She's in timeout for her playing the harlot, for her being the prostitute, for her in engaging in a wholesale idolatry and turning away from God and, and, and his ways. So to finish the wrongdoing, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, right? Not just partial righteousness, but everlasting righteousness, and then to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Um, the most holy place is a reference to the temple. So most prophecy buffs see that this first verse, verse 24, is kind of this broad overview snapshot from beginning to end of from Daniel's time period all the way up to what we would label the end of the 70th week, which is still future. What mo most prophecy buffs also recognize is that there's a mystery in the Bible that, that many of the Old Testament prophecies were not privy to. It's a mystery that only, only the New Testament writers experienced firsthand, particularly Paul. And we're talking about the mystery of the gospel that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapters two and three and, and throughout the rest, throughout the whole letter there, the mystery of the gospel. And the mystery is this, that the people of God are composed not merely of Israel, but of anyone who joins Israel's God and becomes part of the faithful people through faith, not through conversion or not through ethnicity, but through faith in the God of Israel specifically by faith in the Messiah of Israel. 
That's how you join the people of God. And why this is relevant to end time prophecy is because this mystery was not made known to the Old Testament saints, to the Old Testament prophecies. That's why it's called a mystery. It was hidden to them. It was not hidden to God, however. So God gave little kind of hints about it in the Old Testament, telling Abraham, through you all the nations, the Gentiles of the earth will be blessed. Right? The nations is part of the of the mystery. But by the time we get to Paul, Paul can speak about the times of the Gentiles and the, the fullness of the Gentiles in Romans chapter 11. And so Paul realized that what God had done in his mercy and grace is he had partially blinded Israel because of her rejection of Messiah in the first century. And in this partial hardening and partial blinding, God put, as it were, a pause on the 490-year timetable that Daniel had foreseen. And instead of being sequentially from one year one all the way up to 490, there was this pause after 483, and then the Gentiles were brought into the picture in mass. And in doing so, we've kind of been put on pause, and there's this gap created. And I'm fully convinced that this gap is part of the mystery of the Gentiles being brought into the people of God and being brought into the plan of God. And that's why Daniel didn't see it. It wasn't foretold that, hey, at 483 years, there's going to be this gap that's introduced for 2,000 years nearly now before the final seven years clock starts tick, ticking again. God foresaw it, but Daniel didn't foresee it. So if you some people don't subscribe to that. I think preterists uh, don't subscribe to that gap theory. But how then do they explain the church age? How then do they explain the fact that this... 490 years that Daniel was foretold has now been longer than 2,000 years, right? And we're not talking about the Seventh-day Adventist version of the 2,300 days mentioned in Daniel chapter 8, where Daniel talks about the 2,300 days that Seventh-day Adventists interpret as years, thus ending up with some time period that dead ends at 1844, right? We're not talking about that. You can do a Google search for that. Daniel's 2,300 days um, Seventh-day Adventism, 1844, and you'll get the idea. Something I do not subscribe to. Uh, instead, the point I'm trying to make is the gap theory of the bringing in of the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles, the, the bringing of, in of the Gentile peoples into the plan of God is part of the mystery, and it is definitely part of of um, history now, of Israel's history, because the church is that bubble that's put right in the middle of Israel's history. And if if, if you don't subscribe to the church, well, then why are you listening to my a podcast and watching my YouTube videos? Um, um, so I, I, I think you get the idea. But I said all that to say that when Daniel's been told that uh, we need to make an end of sin to make atonement for guilt and to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy place, that includes the ending of the seven years that final seven years, which means that the clock starts ticking again. Somehow this gap uh, uh, is brought to, a, uh, the parentheses is closed, as it were, the church age, and thus God starts dealing primarily with Israel again, and not so much with the Gentile nations. We also need to understand that um, part of Daniel's prophecy is that the Jerusalem itself is going to be trampled down. Uh, uh, let me see if it's in this, um, in this part of the um, prophecy. Um, it's not here, but Jerusalem, there are other prophecies, the place that we'll look at uh, in time, where the language is told that the holy city of Jerusalem is going to be more or less under foreign occupation or control or influence in some way, shape, or fashion uh, for a good chunk of this times of the Gentiles, which, if you think about it, historically, when, when King Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem and um, exiled the people up into Babylon, and he and he sacked the temple and and, and burned Jerusalem. Um, well, I don't know how much of it he burned, but he took control of it. That was the first time in Israel's history that Jerusalem had fallen under the control of a foreign power of a foreign ruler. That began the times of the Gentiles, I believe. That's most prophecy students agree with me. That's the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Right at that point, when, when with, with Babylon, with the very first um, golden head and in, in Nebuchadnezzar statue in Daniel chapter 2, that's the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. From that point forward, even until current time, Jerusalem um, has, in some way, shape, or fashion, been under the control or sway or influence, and sometimes directly, but many times indirectly, of foreign powers. Even today, she doesn't 
you know, uh, uh, the Jewish people in Israel don't have all control of the parts of Jerusalem that they want. You know, Jerusalem has east and west parts. It's split into to sections where we got to give um, Jewish people this part of Jerusalem. We got to give the Muslim and, and Palestinian peoples, the Arab peoples, the um, other part of Jerusalem. And there's still this 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 debate over over which part of Jerusalem belongs to which people group. You know, across the West Bank, and that part is given over to the Palestinians or whatever, or um, the Gaza Strip. Well, that's that's part of Israel, but that part belongs to these these um segregated peoples you know so there's all of this conflict still even up in our present day only finally when we start this final 70th week i believe the antichrist is going to allow the jewish people to have as it were full control of their city once again but even then antichrist is going to be pulling the strings in the background it's not really until god establishes his kingdom on earth here for the millennial time period that's when israel will finally and jerusalem will finally be back in full control of 100% of not just Israel, but the people of God, and the you know um, the Messiah will be ruling and reigning from planet Earth. So let's look again at this um, some of these charts that we would look we kind of hinted at last week. We've got Daniel seventieth week of Daniel seventieth week of Daniel, where uh, this is just one time frame. Uh, you don't have to agree with it. Uh, where it talks about at the far left, the 444 BC, the decree of Artaxerxes. Some people say that time frame is not quite accurate. Um, it's really the decree of Cyrus that started this 490 years. Um, either way, uh, it it either dead ends at the Messiah being cut off at 33 AD, or it dead ends at the destruction of um, Jerusalem, the, 400, uh, the, the 483 years. So whether you move it up up a little bit or back a little bit, slide that scale, it, I, I, I'm, I'm not really a, uh, that picky about that, where the decree started. But there was a decree to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Um, and Daniel describes it as seven weeks of 49 years. And then we got the 62 week of 434 years, uh, totaling of 483 years. You can see that big cross kind of in the middle where Messiah is cut off. You can say that's Christ, the Messiah. Um, or some people say that this is some type of anointed person uh, that's cut off, um, but not necessarily uh, Messiah himself, because the word Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew, simply means anointed one. Could be someone else that we're talking about. I'm not saying there's another Messiah. Don't misunderstand me. I'm saying that the prophecy could allow for that it's Jesus that's in there, or that it's just a very important um, religious person uh, that that fit that bill. But either way... Um, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD uh, is really um, uh, kind of one of the stop ends of the 483 years uh, where we might say the beginning of the gap, the church age. You can see that kind of the red arrow there at the bottom uh, kind of comes in. That's what I call the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the Gentiles being brought in. Um, that is a reality to us now. And it's not like it was plan B to God. Remember, it's called a mystery because we in the Old Testament didn't see it. But God saw it because he can see the future from the beginning. And so from his perspective, it was always part of his plan, which means in hindsight, which is always 2020, right? In hindsight, the gap was always supposed to be there. And we call it a gap because it's longer than the 490 years will allow by any stretch of the imagination. Therefore, it must be a gap that's included in there. I, I, I keep emphasizing this because there are some people who say, well, there isn't any gap. That's the preterist view, the view that that all of history has been closed up in that time. But then how do the preterists explain the last 70th week? How, how do they explain Daniel? How do they explain that Yeshua said that there's something future? How do they explain John's revelation that talks about events that are clearly future with detail that even by a, a, an allegorical stretch of the imagination can't have happened yet? Right. The, the, the preterist perspective, in my opinion, has some fatal flaws. Particularly, one of them is the rapture, which is also a mystery. Paul talks about how that the resurrection, the snatching away, the catching up into the air, where we receive new bodies in, in First and Second Thessalonians, he uses the word mystery again. What does that tell me? That means the rapture wasn't foreseen in the Tanakh. It's not part of the Old Testament prophecies in black and white and right in your face. There are types and shadows of raptures that take place in the Old Testament, right? Um, 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 uh, Elijah being taken up in the world went into heaven. Okay, that's a kind of a rapture, right? Enoch walked with God and, was, was, and wasn't found anymore because God took him. Okay, that's kind of a taken up bodily to be with God. Um, so there are kind of types and shadows of raptures that took place in the Old Testament. But by and large, the event that's going to be a worldwide event where 
Yeshua collects all of his faithful, both living and dead, to to be with him, right? That we read about in the New Testament, the the the, the um snatching away the resurrection, our blessed hope that Peter talks about, or that um, Jude talks about. Um, that is actually a mystery. It was a mystery to the Old Testament saints. They didn't they didn't see that. God didn't give them that. That's why it's called. You ready for it? A mystery. That's part of the gap because when this gap comes to a an end, as it were, we say Antichrist covenant with the Jews, 70th week, 70th advent of Messiah. Somewhere in there, we have to factor in um, the rapture, which again, that either takes place at the beginning of the 70th week, right? The beginning of the last final seven years, in the middle of it, or somewhere right up to the middle, or maybe at the very end, depending on what your theology is. So let's look at another um, version of this map. It's, again, same concept, a giant picture of 70 weeks, 490 years. Um, with uh, Daniel's prophecy at the far left revealed, and then just move, going from left to right, um, Artaxerxes' decree, or uh, or you could say Cyrus' decree. Uh, again, I know some people go one or the other, and there's a difference of like almost seven, uh, uh, 50 years between the two, or 30 years between which decree you think is when this uh, began. And depending on where you start the the um, beginning of the 69 weeks, it will cause your ending to be either as early as the triumphal entry of Yeshua in the 30s, or it'll be as late as the destruction of the temple in the 70s of the first area. In other words, there's like that 40-year difference between those windows. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to say which one is the best view because they both have, they both accomplish the same purpose. They both cover the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple, and then the sacking of both of them once again by uh, 70 AD. So they both kind of end up with the same kind of net effect. So I'm not going to argue. It's not a point of contention for me. But either way, you have to kind of the same general time. Time frame 69 weeks are kind of clustered together and then we've got this church age current gap which again i am confident that this is the times of the gentiles the the um the fullness of the gentiles that must come in that paul talked about it's the age of gentile domination of from israel's perspective a domination of either the city of jerusalem and or uh, um the people of israel not having total autonomy over that part of their land because of the Gentile influences around them, right? I'm not saying that the, the Israel's at war with the Gentiles. I'm simply saying that they don't have complete control to make all the policies that they'd like to for all. I mean, think about it right now. In 2023, the Jewish people still cannot go up on the Temple Mount and pray. Why? Because it's Muslim controlled, okay? <laughs> and it's been that way ever since Jerusalem got destroyed and the Muslims came, uh, the, the uh, Islam uh, came in. But even before that, when the Romans sacked uh, Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 70 AD with Titus armies and things like that, and Israel got plowed under, um, uh, the city of Jerusalem, is just, Jerusalem has just been a mess since 70 AD. She's not been fully functional, right? The temple has not been rebuilt for almost 2,000 years. So that's the gap. And so that didn't take God by surprise. It just took, it would take the prophets of old by surprise. Paul was given this mystery, right? He revealed it, and he was the apostle who, to the Gentiles to explain how, because of this blindness, the Gentiles have been brought in to this relationship with God in mass, right? Instead of just trickling in one here and one there. And then got the 70 week on the far end, far right, where we're going to see this time period pick up again. Let's look at the Preterist version of that. Again, 70 weeks, 490 years. From the Preterist perspective on the far left, 455 BC, the word to restore Jerusalem. And then we got the seven weeks of 49 years. Then we got 62 weeks of 434 years. Blow that up a little bit. And um, um, you can see as we cross over from BC to CE, Jerusalem is rebuilt. Messiah arrives in 29 or around 30. And then from the Preterist perspective, the, um, the, the, the counting never stopped. There was no gap. Messiah was cut off around 33, and then around 36, you've got the end of the 70th weeks, uh, and you've got a picture of a Roman there, um, uh, so I guess that's Titus, uh, with 36, um, I don't know what, what they're trying to say, what 36 is exactly, um, but uh, somehow the, the temple gets destroyed a little later on in 70, and then for them, there's no gap, which means, I guess for them, the rapture took place already, or there is no rapture, there is no resurrection. I mean, that's why the Preterist view, in my opinion, is the weakest of all those four. We're talking about the historicist, the Preterist, the um, uh, uh, the Futurist, and the Idealist. Uh, we didn't even bring in the Eclectic version, but um, 
of all those four views, the the uh, um, uh, the predators I think is the weakest one, especially when we're talking about the rapture and the and the resurrection. I mean, what do they do with that? So that's that's their version. Um, one last resource you can do again, same same time period. This one is the final seventieth week. We looked at this last week as well. Seven year period, one week, seven years. We got seven years broken up into three and a half and three and a half. There are verses that talk about how this is twelve hundred sixty days and twelve hundred sixty days, so three and a half and three and a half years. Um, covenant uh, peace treaty was made with Israel and the surrounding people groups, so that they can kind of have this peace agreement between them. Selves, that's not going to be a secret, right? I think there's no one in the world, no country in the world that, that will um, be unaware of this peace treaty that's made between Israel and her surrounding neighbor groups. I mean, at the very least, we're talking about something that will allow Israel to begin worshiping on the Temple Mount again. That, again, won't be a secret to the world. Um, um, three and a half years into this, the Antichrist is going to defile whatever religious edifice was um, erected at that time, whether it be a full-blown temple or some type of a, a, a portable tabernacle structure. We don't know. But he's going to sit in that temple and defile it and bring that system crashing down for the Jewish people. And then at that point in time, an abomination of desolation takes place. Of course, that's Daniel talking, Yeshua confirming. And at that point in time, persecution is going to ramp up, not just for Jews, but for Christians as well, because the Antichrist is going to demand worldwide worship at that point in time to read uh, the first and second Thessalonian uh, books, which we're going to reference here tonight. Great Tribulation will start, um, if it hasn't already been going on, right? The growing pains of the four horses of the apocalypse in the first three and a half years will have already been taking place. What what the book of Revelation calls seals one through three and four or so, that's the four horses of the apocalypse. You guys know what I'm talking about. The the white horse, the 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 red horse, the black horse, the red horse, and the pale horse. I think I've got them out of order. I think it's black, red. I think it's white, uh, uh, red, black, and then pale, something like that. But that's the first half of the week. And then the second half is the really bad stuff, the, the, the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist just going wild, the devil going wild, killing anyone and everyone who doesn't take the mark and, and bow, to, bow to him and confess that he's God. Of course, Christians and Jews and a lot of other peoples, not just Christians and Jews, but there are a lot of people who are going to resist. And the devil doesn't care. So it's going to be like off with your head. Um, That'll be the final three and a half years. Somehow, we will be raptured out either prior to all of the bad stuff happening at the very beginning or in the midpoint. If you think if you're a mid tripper um, or if you're a pre rather like me, you'll be it'll be after the midpoint, but before the ending. So sometime maybe like two thirds of the way in. Or if you're a post tripper, the rapture, you're going to go through an entire seven years of of of, of um, you know what hitting the fan and uh, you won't get raptured until the final end. But um, eventually at the very end. Um, the devil, the Antichrist, the false messiah, uh, the false prophet, I'm sorry, they're all going to launch some intense military campaign against God, against his messiah. They're going to mass around Jerusalem near uh, the area of Armageddon or Jerusalem and or both, that whole part of the Middle East. Um, maybe uh, the kings of the east will be coming out from the uh, Euphrates River side of the, of, of the world. Um, you know, maybe a, an army from China or something like that from, from India, who knows? Russia coming swooping down from the north. This giant, massive, last ditch effort from the from the Satan to overthrow um, uh, God's uh, people and God's regime and 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 uh, God's system of things and just wipe out any remnant of God's people, you know, Jews and Christians alike. Um, I don't think the devil, in my opinion, I don't think the devil views non-Jews as God's people unless you're Christians. In other words, I am of the impression that unless you're part of Israel or part of Christianity, the devil doesn't particularly see you as a, as a major threat. So if you're of a, of a type of religion that's non-Jewish, non-Christian, you fall into the kind of the camp of, of you're on the devil's side kind of by default. In other words, the book of Revelation talks about how the devil in chapter 12, near the very end, how Satan is thrown down to earth and goes off to make war with those who are the offspring of the woman, i.e. Israel, and those who keep the testimony of Jesus. That would be the Christians, but not just Christians, but also Messianic Jews. But he doesn't say anything about those who are of, the, of other religions, right? So um, that's the point I'm trying to make, is the tribulation is going to be a time of intense persecution for for genuine Christians, but also for just um, Jewish people or those who are going to remain loyal to the the covenant of, of Moses. So people of the book, 
right? Is the point I'm trying to make. People of both the Old and New Testament. Um, so those are some charts that we that we kind of talked about. When we're looking at these key scriptures, though, let's go back now. So that's Daniel's, uh, uh, from an overview, Daniel's prophecies are key when we're talking about studying end-time events. Number two, the Olivet Discourse. It was the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach who taught about the sign of his second coming on the Mount of Olives during the final week of his life on earth. What he said ought to parallel what the scripture teaches in other places since Messiah is the author of the visions of Daniel, right? Confer from, uh, compare from Daniel 10, 5 through 6, compare with Revelation 1, 13 through 16. I'll have an overlay uh, uh, um, graphic sometime later on in my study that shows how uh, what Yeshua talks maybe I have it here maybe give me a second yeah we'll see this tonight where um uh what Yeshua talks about maybe tonight maybe next week depends how much time I have what Yeshua lays down in Matthew 24 and it's synoptic versions of Mark 13 and Luke uh 17 this all of a discourse matches perfectly what what Yeshua gave to John in the book of Revelation as well same author right Yeshua in Matthew Mark and Luke and Yeshua in John so that makes sense why they should uh, compare and, and match with one another. So these are the instructions known as the Olive Discourse. And the book of Revelation is part of that kind of extended uh, look at end time events. I go on to say that when the sequence in Matthew 24, 3 through 31 is examined, it will be found to parallel what Shaul taught in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 and 2 Thessalonians, particularly chapters 1 and 2, and what we read in Revelation. So let's look at uh, part of this real quick as well tonight. So we got Matthew 24. It's labeled in my in this ES, in the NESB version of my Bible. Signs of Christ's return at the very beginning, Matthew 24. And the entire chapter is given over to Yeshua explaining signs of not just his um, return, right, which include both rapture as well as second coming, but also it's signs of what we now know as the day of the Lord, this final intense wrath of God and judgment and tribulation that's going to be poured out not just on the on the wicked systems of the world but the the tribulation and the time period that's going to be coming upon the world is to purify national israel and to separate the wheat from the chaff and to 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 purify the compromising and um uh dead church right there there's basically three if you want to think about it three versions of the church in existence at any any point in time of the body of messiah there's the true faithful church, there's the um, compromising church, and then if we slide that scale to the far end, there's the dead church, right? So which type of Christian are you? Are you a true and faithful Christian? Are you a compromising Christian? Or are you a dead Christian? Meaning you're not really a Christian at all. Somewhere on that scale is where you need to find yourself. And we'll look at that when we get to the book of Revelation and talk about the seven churches, which churches kind of characterize and typify which kind of Christian and church uh, we are looking at. But the point I'm trying to emphasize is that the time period that's going to be coming upon planet Earth for the, in this last seven years with the tribulation, the birth pangs, the four horses of the apocalypse at the beginning of the seven weeks, and the intense great tribulation and wrath of God near the end of the three and a half weeks, part of the reason for that to come upon the entire world is because we need to, God needs to use this time period to not just purify the church and to uh, purge out that which is not good, right? The way you would boil and heat up metal so as to allow the dross to rise to the surface and to, to get rid of the impurities. God's going to use that intense persecution and time period to purify his people and to get his bride ready to receive the bridegroom who's going to come at the uh, either the, the rapture and or the second coming at the very end of that seven-year period. But at the same time, it will be the time of Jacob's trouble. The Old Testament refers to it as this time. Jacob needs to be purified. Israel, national Israel, needs to be brought to her knees as well so that national repentance can finally take place as has been foretold over and over again in the scriptures. Well, this is foretold in Matthew 24 as well. Um, Yeshua talks about these types of tribulations uh, and, and, and uh, things that are going to be ramping up, perilous times. But of interest for us is that right in the middle of this discussion, he talks about this abomination of desolation spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. This language is directly paralleled by the midpoint of the 70th week, where the Antichrist is said to take his place in the temple of God. Paul talks about this in the Thessalonian books. 
um, take his place in the temple of God and declare himself to be God and demand worldwide worship. At that point in time, we will see a disruption of whatever a religious system was implemented by uh, the Jewish people in Israel at that point in time. Temple set up will be defiled, temple will be defiled, uh, standing in the holy place. That's a reference to the temple or some religious uh, edifice, a, 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 tab- a functioning tabernacle or full-blown temple, depending on if the, um, the Muslims allow a temple to be reconstructed up there or where the Dome of the Rock is. We don't know. But the point being is Yeshua, from his point, when Yeshua spoke these words, the temple was still in existence. And yet, there was no Antichrist that sat in the temple and declared himself to be God in 70 AD. Now, I know the predators are going to come in and say, well, it was actually um, Titus who went in and defiled the temple and he set himself up. But he didn't declare himself to be God as far as I can recall. This was all foreshadowed by Antiochus Epiphanes two centuries before Yeshua during the time period of the, Ma- the, the Maccabees that we read about in a, um, in a Deuterocanonical version of your Bible, right, in the Maccabean books. But that was earlier. Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus, if you want to call it that, say it that way, he was a foreshadow or forerunner or a type and shadow of the um, of the future Antichrist figure who's going to actually sit in the temple and defile the temple once more. So we know that historically Antiochus, he did do that. He went into the temple, he defiled it with um, a, an abominable sacrifice, and so the temple got desecrated. And so it had to be cleansed, and that's what the whole story of the Maccabees and Hanukkah is all about that particular uh, event. You can read about that online. You can go to my own website and and read my own commentaries about Hanukkah and things like that if you're not familiar. But Yeshua seems to indicate that it's going to happen again in the future. And so um, the interesting uh, parallel is that Luke describes this time period as as, uh, Jerusalem's being surrounded by armies. He doesn't talk about the abomination of desolation. He talks about when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you need to, those who are in Jerusalem and Judea need to flee. Those who are, who are in Jerusalem need to get out, blah, blah, blah. So it's it's the same time period. So there's going to be some type of military campaign that takes place right around the midpoint of the week as well, where the Antichrist and his armies are going to uh, either uh, subdue Jerusalem in that area or uh you know occupy as, as it were uh the city um how much they'll destroy we don't know revelation 17 seems to indicate that perhaps they might burn and sack parts of jerusalem at the point in time or it could be till the very end we're not, we're not sure uh but either way these are prophecies that yeshua gave in very in, in striking detail that match up with revelation we'll look at a chart here in a moment he talks about false christs uh, that are going to raise up. And then he talks about the, the the immediately after the tribulation, there's going to be these cosmic disturbances, sun, moon, and stars that are spoken of way back in the Old Testament that are paralleled throughout other parts of the New Testament and, of course, show up in the book of Revelation as well. And these become kind of markers for us to line up and synchronize the events so that we know we're on the right track as far as um, a timetable, these um uh, cosmic signs that Yeshua talks about. You see they're, they're all in all caps in the uh, NASB version of your Bible here. The reason they're in all caps is because they're referencing some Old Testament prophecy, particularly probably Joel and Isaiah and, thing, and, and, and uh, Ezekiel, where it talks about sun being dark and moon not giving its light and the stars falling from the sky, powers of heaven being shaken, sign of the Son of Man, things like that. Th- this will not be a secret rapture, folks. Just get that out of your head. There will be a rapture. I'm firmly convinced, 100% convinced of a conviction convinced that there will be a rapture. So let's just get it out of your head that there isn't a rapture. Like people are saying, the rapture is a hoax. Nope, not in your life. It's going to happen. But it won't be secret. That's the point of, of difference that I want to make. It's not a secret rapture. Yeshua says in verse 30 of Matthew 24, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. We could translate the word earth there as land if you want to, meaning all the tribes of the land will mourn. But they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. The lightning flashing from one end of the sky to the other. This will not be a secret event. Right, so there's no secret rapture. It'll be a worldwide flash, right? Especially with the um, let me back up a little bit with the with the entire Earth being darkened by the sun, the moon, and the stars. Everything's turned, lights are turned out. Suddenly, the flash of light with the glory of Messiah uh, 
um, snatching away his faithful uh, to be with him in the air. Yeah, that no, you're not going to miss that, no matter where in the world you are. Everyone's going to see it. So, um, um, when we look at this chart, let me bring this chart up for you on the on the uh, screen. We got Matthew 24 on the left side of the chart, and we got Revelation 6 and through 7 on the right side of the chart, and the parallels right in the middle. Notice these parallels. Um, we got the Antichrist and False Christ paralleled in, in both Matthew and Revelation. We got the wars. We got the famine. We got the martyrdom, which we might call the Great Tribulation. We got the result of the martyrdom, the Great Tribulation, the celestial disturbances, the raptured saints, and the Day of the Lord's wrath. And these are given labels in the book of Revelation. The first seal, the second seal, third, fourth, fifth, sixth interlude, and then seventh seal. This is the detail that we're going to end up looking at eventually when we get to the book of Revelation. But we're going to start where we should, which is by going through the Old Testament material that points towards the New Testament um, occurrences. And Matthew uh, does a great job of, of highlighting those for us. Again, rapture we looked at this uh last week for views of the rapture the little yellow circle where does the rapture take place in the in the scope of the seven year um time period is it at the beginning of the rapture of the tribulation like pre-tribbers say and the entire seven years is the wrath of god is it in the middle of the seven years where the rapture is that yellow circle second down from the left and the wrath of God is the final three and a half years. Is it the pre-wrath, where the wrath of Satan is that pink arrow pointing to the left, pointing towards the middle point of the seven years? And then the rapture is in the middle of that with that yellow circle. And then the final gray arrow pointing to the right is the wrath of God, that intense last kind of um, half of the half of the three and a half years. Or is it post-trib? The entire seven years is tribu tribulation, or wrath of God is at least the last half of that, and then rapture is at the very end. Which view is correct? Well, I can't make up your decision for you. I can't make your mind for you. I can't tell you which one you sh you must believe. That's for you and God to to figure out on your own. I can tell you that I'm going to make a case for the pre-wrath. That's my perspective. And uh, by the end of this study, um, I hope that it's your perspective as well. But I could be wrong, but I think that's the perspective that I'm going to go with for now because that's where all the biblical data is pointing me in that direction. So I'm going to stand on that perspective. Eventually, um, we're going to find out that um, what's of most importance is not where the rapture takes place, but the important thing is, are you prepared to meet the Lord? Are you prepared for the, Yeshua to meet you? That's what's most important. And so if you're not prepared now, don't think that you're just going to automatically be prepared a day before it happens. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you need to be you you need to make your decision who who if Yeshua is Lord now you need to start um preparing yourself for this intense time period because if you're not prepared and let's say you have to go through all that mess you might not make a decision for Yeshua you might fall susceptible fall susceptible to the great deception that's going to take place when the Antichrist shows up and sets up his one world religious and political and monetary system and enforces the mark of the beast and causes everyone to worship him and and god himself sends the strong delusion you know that's going to be the wrong time to try and make your decision i'm not going to say i'm not going to say it's impossible to make a decision then but it'll just be more difficult so make up your mind now so that's uh the 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 details out of the book of matthew um the uh, uh all of the discourse matthew mark and luke we are also going to see <clears throat> Number three, the Thessalonian epistles talk about, and it's Paul who gives us some detailed information regarding the moment when Messiah returns for his own. This time we're talking about primarily rapture slash resurrection. Shaul tells us that what he teaches us is, quote, by the word of the Lord, end quote. So it's trustworthy, 1 Thessalonians 4.15. The information he gives us perfectly parallels what Yeshua taught in the Olivet Discourse and the Book of Revelation. So it's no um, wonder. We should have perfect parallels. So when we're talking about um, Thessalonians, let me pull up this tab. We got the Day of the Lord, right? The Day of the Lord is that intense judgment of God against the wicked humanity and also against um, apostate Israel and against the apostate church. It's the judgment against wickedness in general, against um, idolatry, against fornication against um uh spiritual uh, uh wickedness spiritual uh fornication idolatry hierarchy um um rebellion against god right we're talking about a system that's in place in the earth today 
that is opposed to everything that's um, messianic, every opposed to everything that's truly Christ centric. Um, this includes secular humanism, right? Um, it could be as benign as um, you know something that opposes God, but peacefully. But it can be as as uh, say uh, um, dark and evil as uh, a cult and cultic and satanic worship and 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 all of that uh, you know uh, uh, systems and darkness that's in the earth today. It, it doesn't matter where on the scale you find yourself. If you're not on God's side, then you're against God. That's the point. If you're not for God, then you're against Him. If you're not naming Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, then you are against God. That's what. That's what God is coming to judge, is everything that is not in, um, in uh, agreement with, with God and his Messiah, right? Psalm, the psalmist in chapter 2 describes it well, right? The, 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 the nations are enraged and, and set, up, set themselves against God and against his anointed one, right? Um, it doesn't matter. In fact, let me just pull that verse because that's such a powerful um, reference. Let me pull it for you so you can see it for yourself. Why do the nations rage, the psalmist says. Why are the nations restless, verse 1 of Psalm chapter 2, and the peoples plotting in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand again, and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let's tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. Right? He who sits in the heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Right, then he'll speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, this is God speaking, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will announce the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son, today I've fathered you. Ask it of me, and I will certainly give the nations as your inheritance, and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now then, you kings, use insight. Let yourselves be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son that he be not angry, and you shall perish in the way. For his wrath may be kindled quickly. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is a snapshot of what's going to take place at the end of the age. This is, this is the very final seven years and final wrath of God, where the nations are gathering themselves together with, under the banner of Antichrist and Satan and the false prophet. Right, they're mustering their last ditch effort to overthrow God and God's um, kingdom and God's anointed, right? Who is Messiah? Of course, we know the end of the story. Yeshua is going to come and wipe them all out, right? Praise God. But he's going to judge the nations of the earth, and wickedness must be judged. So it's not just a time period of the purging of national Israel. It will be that time. But God also is going to be um, purifying a people for himself. Finally, those who will enter into the millennial kingdom ready to serve their God and their King Messiah. So that's why so there's going to be so many casualties and so much destruction on earth because the world is full up of wickedness. It's filled to the brim. So God has to bring judgment, just like he brought judgment during the time of Noah's flood, right? Which is another parallel to the judgment of the end of the age. The, the Noetic flood is a parallel to that. God couldn't simply just wink and, and, and turn a blind eye to wickedness any longer. He said, I've got to bring judgment. It's filled up. It's brought it. It's, 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 it's piled up to heaven, as it were, the, the, the offenses uh, uh, against um, God's righteousness, right? Mankind has offended a righteous God. And that's why judgment in, that we're going to read about in the final parts of the book of Revelation are not just centered on Israel as a people group or Jerusalem as a city, but they are worldwide judgments and, and punishments because the entire world has become drunk in the wickedness and the adulterous um, actions of um, idolatry and harlotry. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a mess. The world is in a mess. So that's what we're looking at. The Thessalonians, we call this intense uh, uh, um, persecution or wrath. Uh, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, it's God's day, the day of God, the day of judgment, the day of God, the day of the Lord. Um, and so we're going to read about that in time to come. But let's finally look at the one more, uh, the book of Revelation itself. Number four on my list is I'm drawing this part of my study to a close. Then we'll look at next week, we'll look at, uh, begin to look at some of these key passages, both in the Tanakh, as well as the Apostolic Scriptures. So I've got a list here, if you can see on my screen, um, of a lot of passages that I put together. Uh, that are of interest. I just put the chapters in there. Um, not not that all of the chapters speak to that particular event, but uh, we're going to eventually see 
that um, uh, there are a lot of verses in the Old Testament that uh, lend support for our understanding of the book of Revelation and some of these uh, key events. So <clears throat> we'll begin to look at that next week. But our last one on the list for tonight is the book of Revelation itself. If you're going to study end-time prophecy and you don't read the book of Revelation, then you've done yourself a disservice. This is where the prayer view again runs into trouble, runs into foul. Because they believe that the book of Revelation is basically already completed, they're not studying it with a view towards anything that's future. And so the preterist, which is, which is fast becoming more and more popular these days, again, preterist, P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T. -E -E we looked at this a few weeks back. Do a Google search for it. Preterist. It's the view of prophecy that believes that everything was fulfilled basically in the, up to the first century with the destruction of the temple primarily and the sacking of Jerusalem in the year 130 and so. Um, all of that means that the, the Bible itself is, is complete. There's nothing really future. That's the preterist, at least the total preterist, the full, full preterist perspective. I do not hold to that perspective when it comes to eschatology. I hold to more of a futurist with a little bit of a historicist built in there for practical purpose because there are certain historical events that I also draw um, inferences from like past history of Babylon, of, of Persia, of Greece, Rome, of events with Antiochus, of um, and and the events of of, of the destructions of the temples, uh, up into the current age. That's kind of historicist aspect. Um, but for the most part, when I read through the book of Revelation, a lot of it's future, a lot of it's future. So now when we begin to look, when we're going to begin eventually look at the book of Revelation, if Daniel gives us the time frame for the end times and the Olivet Discourse, gives us a thumbnail sketch of the sequence of the end times, then Revelation gives us the details. It's going to just lay everything out for us. And then we're eventually going to look at specific passages of importance. I have the following note at the bottom of your screen there. The following list is not exhaustive and is subject is subject to modification as the study progresses. So yeah, as we're going along, we're going to be looking at this list here, um, but uh, it it may it may change. As you notice on the list, I go all the way back to Genesis when we're talking about um, end time events. You're like, why would you go back to Genesis? You'll find out next week. We'll start next week, but that'll do it for um, eschatology, a biblical study of end time events. These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week by myself, Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. I'm a torture to your congregation, K. Latunavada Harvest in uh, Thornton, Colorado. Find us online at grafting.com and join us in, in person for our live Sabbath services. But if you're not able to join us, at least as I mentioned, join us online and um, you can see the link to the video right there on my screen as well. These uh, live internet studies are a part of my own um, tour teaching ministry, which parks itself on the web at tetzetorah.com. That's T-E-T-Z-E-T-O-R-A-H.com. I'd love to have you join me at my own home uh, personal website there and uh, browse around and take a look through all the uh, commentaries that you see on my screen right now as well. I also have a YouTube channel that I'd be delighted if you uh, popped in and um, took a look around there as well. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Tetsay Torah Ministries. If you do hit my website, uh, my YouTube channel there, be sure to uh, take notice that I update the uh, site essentially daily, uploading videos daily. Make sure then to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, leave thumbs up for all the videos that you like. Um, leave me some comments and questions about things you have um, uh, your own thoughts on. And be sure to share the content with your other friends and family members in your social media circles, okay? Just some brief important uh, details. If you'd like to join us for our live studies, be sure to get access to Skype somehow. If you're on my website right now, um, uh, during the live study and you click on that blue Skype link, it'll actually open up Skype in your browser and you can just join us right there. And we hope you can join us live because we engage in a uh, live Q&A after the study is over, opening up the microphones and it's exclusively to the um, uh, live studies um, uh, that we uh, enjoy engage in that live study uh, Q&A. But if not, um, take one last moment to scroll to the very bottom of my website where you can see some Hebrew writing and the black section down there. And uh, prayerfully consider partnering with me to take the Torah around the world uh, in this particular format. You can click on the little yellow donate button and um, bless me that way with your uh, financial gifts and contributions. And I'm so uh, blessed to be able to be in a place where I can receive uh, your generous gifts. Uh, thank you to all of those who have given in the past and are continuing to give. I'm so uh, 
uh, thrilled to be on the receiving end of, of your generosity. And as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. Let's turn to a Trinitarian response to Biblical Unitarianism. My name is Ari Ben Lyman Hanavi, and this is a 30-minute study broken up into two parts. Um, when it hits the YouTube uh, video land, it'll be part one and part two, um, video one and video two. <clears throat> so like 15 minutes each. And what we've been looking at is kind of excursion material. We are really starting from, let me back up. We're really working from, if you look at my screen, this website known as biblicalunitarianism.com biblicalunitarian.com, a website about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. This is a non-Trinitarian website resource. What they put together is a list of about 30 or 40 different scripture references that are commonly um, taught by Trinitarians to be Trinitarian-leaning verses. But the Biblical Unitarian Christian comes along and says, no, there's probably a better way to read those passages, a better way to explain it from a non-Trinitarian perspective. So allow us to show you the, 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 the Unitarian way to understand what you would normally think is a Trinitarian passage. What I've thought, decided to do is take those same passages and to reclaim them for Trinitarian territory, right? To go back and to answer or to refute or rebut. A re, um, it's not always a refutation. Many times it's just um, a rethinking of the biblical Unitarian views and say, well, no, I think you you overshot your boundaries. Let's re-look at this passage one more time. And so we're going verse by verse. We started with um, Genesis 1.1. We went next to Genesis 1.26. Last week, we started looking at Genesis 11.7. And when you click on the uh, biblical Unitarian resource for Genesis 11.7, let us go down and, and confound their language. Um, that they may not understand one another's speech. Their only explanation is, see our answer to Genesis 126. So you have to go back and listen to the Genesis 126 argument from me to catch their answer and my answer about Genesis 1127. So for that reason, rather than just repeat the same answer for Genesis 126 with 11, um, 117, I decided to take one or two weeks, this is the second week, and do some excursus material on how Unitarians argue like atheists. And this is not a very popular topic. In fact, the video that I uploaded uh, instantly got some thumb da thumbs down, which I'm fine with. This type of topic's a little um, disturbing, especially to Unitarians if you are in that um, camp, uh, because you probably don't want to be identified with um, atheists. You don't want to be um, on the same um, boat. You don't want to be in the same um, uh playing field as them. At least I don't think you want to. Give me a second here. There we go. Um, but this particular blog that I'm borrowing uh, my notes from, he's a Trinitarian, and he is a, um, he's a, he's, his uh, degree is in philosophy, and he has come to understand uncannily how there's an uncanny uh, similarity between the logic processes of biblical Unitarians and atheists in the way their arguments are framed and the words and the um the thought processes and just the way that um a discussion goes when you're when you a trinitarian are dialoguing with a non-trinitarian and the reason i'm bringing this exercise into our discussion here i'm not trying to openly offend unitarians i'm not even really trying to openly offend atheists this is not a discussion about atheism at all it's really a discussion about trinitarian understanding of the bible versus non-trinitarian or in this case biblical unitarian is my uh, uh direct focus and the the purpose is to bring into the, the discussion the possibility that maybe one of the reasons why you're rejecting trinity has not so much to do with what the bible says or doesn't say but has a lot to do with your own pre preconceived notions of what you think the bible should or shouldn't say regarding trinitarian theology so let's scroll back down pick up our our discussion where we left off maybe i can finish it this week we talked basically about again he laid the framework this blogger this is not my words this blogger laid the um framework for the idea that um trinitarians and i'm sorry uh non-trinitarians i.e unitarians and atheists have a similar sort of hey if god were truly trinity then why don't i see this or why doesn't xyz uh, fit the pattern, blah, 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 which the reason that's important 
is because when you're having a discussion and a disagreement with someone over a particular topic, particularly the Bible, and so we're talking about the nature of God, right? It's an ontological argument. We want to use what, what um, material the Bible gives us and make frame our arguments around that. We can't and we shouldn't really center our arguments on suppositions of what we think the Bible should say or shouldn't say. Because at the end of the day, if we are practicing the, the Bible alone as our sole uh, source of ultimate authority, which biblical Unitarians should be, I hope they are. If they aren't, then they're in the world of trouble from the word go. At least many biblical Trinitarians are in that position. I, want, I don't want to say all. At least I am. We'll put it that way. I, for my part, uh, view the Bible as the final authority. As helpful as other resources are, the Bible is the final authority. And even though it doesn't give me all the information I'd like to when it comes to the na- understanding the nature of God, it gives me enough information so I can make a a, um, a, um, a decision. And and that decision is also a, a convictionary decision. So, um, picking up where we left off last week, in an article titled, Is Jesus God? Logical Questions That Need Answers, John Shainheit asks a series of questions. John Shainheit is our... our um, um, case study biblical unitarian he's a he's a predominant contributor to this particular website he might even be the owner of the website i'm not exactly sure but he is a significant uh contributor to the theology of this website so he's the one that's being singled out much the way we use a case study of looking at dr dale tuggy in my um shima study we're using john shanehead as, as our kind of our case study this time it doesn't mean I'm picking on Mr. Shane Height. Um, as far as I know, he's a, he's a genuine believer. I've, I've watched a few of his videos, read a few of his articles and blogs. And as far as I can tell, he does have a genuine relationship with God and with Messiah Yeshua. He just has a mistaken understanding of who God and who Jesus is. That's my point. Other than that, I'm not judging him. But he asks a series of questions that are intended to cast doubt on the deity of Christ. But these questions all assume that Scripture would look a certain way if the Trinity is true. I'll start with a little more detail, but I'll get repetitive. So I'll just point out the wrong assumption about the Trinity that each question implies after that. Okay, so let's look at them. I think I can make it through this. This is question 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then conclusions with about... Three or four paragraphs. Yeah, I can finish this tonight because we got 30 minutes. As long as I don't stop and dilly dally too much. So let's look at this first question. This is a question. The questions are all applied from the biblical Unitarian perspective. All right? Question If Jesus is God, how could he die for our sins? And then here's an answer given by this Trinitarian blogger. What what does this assume about the Bible? It assumes that if the Trinity is true, Jesus couldn't have died since God is immortal. I've heard that argument directly from um, people who are non-Trinitarian that leave comments on my YouTube videos or send me emails or things like that. They say, Jesus obviously isn't God because Jesus died and God can't die. Now, if the Trinity is true, this blogger says, then the scriptures would look how Trinitarians uh, expect them to look. Trinitarians say that Jesus being a man is able to die a human death. This doesn't contradict the Trinity at all. What it contradicts is the Unitarian assumption about what the scriptures would look like if the Trinity is true, which is a very different thing. So right away, what this Trinitarian blogger is trying to establish for us, in case you're not catching it, he's trying to get the biblical Unitarian to rethink his logical objection to Trinity. If you're going to object to what the Bible says, make sure you're objecting to the biblical data rather than just objecting to what you think the Bible should say if it were truly Trinitarian from your perspective. For instance, there's there are some um, people who object to Trinitarian that are downright um, skeptical of even what the Bible says. There are some non-Trinitarians who have now gone to the point where let's just throw out certain verses because they're questionable. We don't like the wording. We don't like the source material. We're we're uncertain of the original manuscript reliability. So what we're going to do is we're going to question those verses and make them suspect. In some cases, some non-Trinitarians end up actually throwing out the um, 
New Testament altogether. And they just say, well, only the Bible is reliable. This, this becomes the extreme monotheistic position that, say, Islam or uh, um, unsaved Ju- Judaism takes, right? They throw out the New Testament altogether and just say, well, we reject Trinity because we reject that entire body of literature known as New Testament. I hope the biblical Trinitarians aren't going in that direction. But unfortunately, if you keep going down the slippery slope of suspecting certain wordage and verbiage in the um, Bible, then eventually you're going to find yourself opposing verse after verse and, and passage after passage. You will end up in that direction, unfortunately, left unchecked in my opinion. And this starts with an idea of, well, if God were truly Trinity, then he should look this way. But that's a subjective perspective. That's what this Trinitarian blogger is trying to bring to your attention. All right. Question number two, how can Jesus be God and have a God at the same time. I hear this one all the time. How can Jesus be God and God be God if Jesus refers to God as his God, right? He refers to the Father as God all the time. Um, You know, um, this means that God, that Jesus must not be God if he's referring to to the Father as God. This is their objection. Again, this is uh, an objection from a non-Trinitarian perspective. This blogger's answer is false assumption. Trinitarian theology implies that Jesus, who is both God and man, cannot have a God, right? That's the assumption from the non-Trinitarian perspective. But notice that it's an assumption. Specifically, Trinitarians have no problem with Jesus having a God. Why? Because Trinitarians do believe Jesus is a man. Let me interject for a moment. In my experience and in dealings with um, um, non-Trinitarian believers or non-Trinitarian non-believers. I don't know if they're a believer or not. That's between them and God. But it's certainly a discussion between um, non-Trinitarians and and, uh, uh, Trinitarians. In my experience, what I've become, what I've begun to ascertain or begin to experience is that a lot of the disagreement that takes place between these two um, types of uh, people, Trinitarian on one side, Unitarian on the other, is... A, dis- a, a disagreement over the um, incarnation, the the way that Jesus became God. Um, was he created as God? Was he created uh, with God-like powers? Was he created as just a fully human and no God-like powers? You know, what, what sliding scale of deity does Jesus fall into? What camp does he fit into? That's where a lot of the disagreement takes place. Um, Orthodox Trinitarians believe that Jesus is truly God and truly man, or we could say fully God and fully man, or you can say 100% God and 100% man, even though that math is wonky. So this um, blogger is bringing that logic back into the discussion. Specifically, Trinitarians have no problem with Jesus having a God because Trinitarians do believe Jesus is a man and a righteous man worships God, right? Hello, that's the right response from a human who's righteous recognizing and affirming that there's one God and that God is God or that the Father is God. Um, If Jesus didn't affirm that the Father was God, then he would have been in error, right? I mean, remind yourself of that. Even biblical Trinitarians recognize that God is God and that the Father is God and that he is the God that you must recognize for in order for you to have this relationship with him. So Jesus is a righteous man. So it's of course understandable understandable that he should be giving God that um, recognition and giving him the place where he belongs. It fits our argument here because the Unitarian assumes, again, there's the assumed word, he assumes that the scriptures would look a certain way if the Trinity is true when Trinitarians have no such assumption and find the scriptures completely compatible with everything they believe. You guys following along with me so far? I hope I'm not losing you. Let's keep moving right along very quickly. Question number three. Again, these are the Unitarian making the question. This is not a Trinitarian question. This is the kind of the skeptical perspective. And again, we're reminding you that this is similar to the way atheists argue against the existence of God. It's the same kind of similar. I'm not saying it's directly the uh, same. I'm not saying there's a one-to-one correlation. So don't misunderstand me. And I don't think the, bo- the blogger is either. He's simply saying that there's a an, an uncomfortable uh, similarity. And it should be uncomfortable to you if you're a biblical Unitarian and you believe yourself to be a Christian. And suddenly you feel like you're being compared with an atheist. Right? If I were a biblical Unitarian and I were reading this blog from a Trinitarian, I would be uncomfortable if these assertions are true. If they turn out to be accurate, 
I don't want to have a mindset that's similar to an atheist, because in my opinion, that's a deficiency. The, the argument from the atheist, well, if God were true, if God existed, then why isn't there universal peace and safety and harmony and love all over the earth, right? If Jesus is, is Messiah, how come the Jews don't believe in him? How come Jesus is God or Jesus is Lord or Messiah isn't emblazoned on the moon or something like that? So, question number three from the biblical Trinitarian or biblical Unitarian camp. If Jesus was sitting at the right hand of God in heaven when the book of Revelation was written, why does Jesus continue to make such clear statements that our Heavenly Father is his, quote, God, end quote, if he himself is God, right? It's similar to the previous one. And here's the answer. False assumption. Trinitarian theology implies that there is something about the resurrection and ascension to the right hand of God that should make Jesus no longer refer to the Father as his God, but the Trinity doesn't imply this. So we've got this mystery in heaven now. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is fully God, and yet the Father is fully God, and yet Jesus is the Son, and the Father is the Father. So there's a hierarchy, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and yet at the same time, they are equal when it comes to God. They're equal in Godship or deity uh, category or quality. God is... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's no distinction in 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 um, in quality in nature, um, right? The homo, homoousian uh, property of God, Jesus, uh, the the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all share the same identical nature. There's one God, right? And yet, in the persons of God, in the in the mystery of it, in the part that we can't fully grasp, because there's nothing on earth like God and nothing in heavens like God. God is completely unique, altogether unique. There's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and there's Son who yields to the Father and the Holy Spirit who yields to both, right? I don't understand exactly how all that works. Um, I can't claim to know that. That's why it's a bit mysterious. But there's enough revelation given so that I can affirm it and um, uh, believe it with a perfect faith. So, you guys following along with this? Let's keep going. Question number four. If God cannot be tempted by evil, yet Jesus was tempted in every way we are, how can he be God? Again, this is a question from a non-Trinitarian kind of objection perspective. And this is another false assumption. Trinitarian theology implies that Jesus did not have human weaknesses. That's why it's false. Trinitarian theology implies that Jesus did not have a human weakness. Well, that's false. Trinitarian theology actually does understand that Jesus did have human weaknesses. That's why it's a false assumption. The truth of the matter is that we Trinitarians um, assert and we agree, we affirm that Jesus was fully functional human. He did have weaknesses. He had human weaknesses. He got tired, right? He got fatigued. He got hungry. He got sleepy. Um, he could, uh, you and you could inflict pain on him. If you cut him, he bled. So those all make sense to us because we believe in the incarnation, that Jesus came as a human. And yet at the same time, he had a dual nature. He was fully human and truly human, and he was fully God and truly God. And that's why we don't have any problem with those particular objections. Again, the the uh, the incarnation answers a lot of the objections that come from the non-Trinitarian side of the house. Question five, if Jesus is God, then why does he pray to God and call him the only true God in John, in John 17, 3? This is a favorite passage that non-Trinitarian particularly Unitarians, start from. A lot of them launch from this. If Jesus calls his Father the only true God, notice the qualifiers, the only true God. Well, doesn't it then imply that um, that Jesus himself is not only not God, but he's not the only true God? Even if we give the Jehovah's Witnesses an answer and a, and a say-so where Jesus is a lesser God, a lesser deity, a demigod, a mini-me, if you want to use an Austin Powers reference, right? Jesus is a miniature version of God, a lesser God, a smaller case G-O-D, like it says in their John 1-1 reference. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, small G-O-D. If that's accurate, then what the Jehovah's Witnesses are affirming is that God the Father is the only true God, Yahweh, Jehovah, and that Jesus is a lesser Yahweh, a lesser small G-O-D, a lesser being of, of Godship, but he's still a God, he's just a, a smaller God, a lesser God. 
of course, we biblical Trinitarians and Orthodox Trinitarians um, disagree with that theology. We believe that's heresy as well. It's heretical. That's that's nonsense. That doesn't fit with the biblical data. I could answer my own. Uh, I could answer it this way. Uh, John seventeen three does use the language of the only true God, but um, there are other New Testament passages that go on to talk about. Um, God is the only God, and I'll flash this on the screen in post-production, and yet Jesus is the only Lord. And if if the logic of the Unitarian here is accurate, that God is the only true God, which supposedly somehow kicks Jesus out of the picture as being a God, then the logic must follow from that argument that God is God, but God is not Lord. Only Jesus is Lord, using that same logic, meaning the Unitarians are in a pickle now, because the, the entire Bible, both both Old and New Testaments, clearly label both God the Father as Lord in the Old Testament, but when we get to the New Testament, both God the Father and Jesus' Son wear that label Lord. There's even a passage in the New Testament that where the Spirit is referred to as Lord in um, Corinthians again. So we have a quandary for the Unitarian who wants to say that because God is qualified by the word only and it's the Father, therefore only the Father is God and Jesus is not, well, then what do they do with all those passages that talk about Lord and they're shared by all three persons? But let's let this blogger answer. He says, once again, this is a false assumption on the part of the uni biblical Unitarian. The Trinitarian theology implies, here's the false assumption, the Trinitarian theology implies that Jesus wouldn't pray, also misunderstands John 17, 3, but that isn't the same kind of assumption we're talking about. Jesus is the same God as the Father, so they are both the only true God. That's what the Trinitarians truly believe. Therefore, to assume that Jesus can't be God because he calls the Father the only true God is a false assumption. Indeed, let me just make the point plain again. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, according to the Trinitarian version, according to the model that I believe is accurate. There's one God, but there are three persons. There's one what, and yet three who's, all with capital W's. Capital W for what? Capital W for who's. Therefore, it is true that the Father is truly God, but in the Trinity mindset and model, we also believe that Jesus is truly God. So we don't have a problem with the man Jesus praying to the Father and saying, you are the only true God. The word only there is just a reference to the category of God or the nature of God. You, Father, are the only true God. But Jesus also is the only true God. Because we're not talking about multiple gods. When we say the only true God, the assumption also from the Unitarian side of the house is that God is a singular unit, that he's a single being, that he cannot be tripart, that he's only a single, well, the, the, uh, the um, uh, some Unitarians refer to him as a um, numerically one, like Dr. Dale Tuggy, who's a, 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 a analytic theologian. He used the terminology of, when we're talking about um, identity theories, he says he is numerically one, meaning he's the only one person, because he, he, he identifies uh, identity and personhood as um, countable. And since humans can be numerically one, God must also be numerically one if he's only one person. Barring discussions about split personality disorder and things like that. So we're not even talking about that. But when we talk about God being singular, from the Unitarian perspective, the assumption is that there's only one person of God. And this is proven supposedly by the pronouns where God is the singular, the pronouns in the, in the Old Testament are all in the singular when it comes to referring to God, right? He, him, I, things like that. They're all in the singular because there's only one God. And they, they say that this is proof that there's only one person of God, not three persons of God. But I beg to differ. Um, when God is referred to in the singular pronoun, it's because he is the only God, but he's not the only person. That's the point of contention. The Bible doesn't say that there's only one person. That's an assumption that's brought into the picture by the non-Trinitarian Christian. And so when they quote the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, in their mind, the word one is followed by the word person. So that they read that verse as, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one person. But in reality, I'm, I don't read the Bible that way. I read it as, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one God. 
not one person. And the word God there includes three persons, but one God. So back to the objection. How can Jesus say that the Father is the only true God, or how can he pray to God, the Father, and recognize him as God? Ah, because he's fully human, he's truly human, that's the mystery of the Incarnation. And yet at the same time, he's one with God because he is very God in nature. Let's move on, right? This shouldn't take us too long. Question number six, if Jesus is God, why did he pray at all? It's a false assumption, same as the previous, that Trinitarian theology implies that Jesus wouldn't pray, right? Um, easy one. Uh, question number seven. If Jesus is God, why did he say to his disciples, quote, trust in God, trust also in me, right? Notice there seems to be some type of um, distinction between the two parties. Trust in God, that's one party. Trust in me, that's another party. Doesn't this seem to imply agency or prove that Jesus and God are distinct? Right, that's the assump that's the uh, argument. Here's the answer: false assumption again. Trinitarian theology implies that Jesus is the same person as the Father. This is that's the false assumption. The truth is that in the Trinity there are more than one persons going on. So the false assumption states Trinitarian theology implies that Jesus is the same person as the Father. That's the false assumption that's being stated by the bloggers, just bringing that to our attention. The truth of the matter is that it's false. I mean, the truth of the matter is the assumption is false. In reality, what we believe as Trinitarians is that there are more than one person. So that's how we easily answer the question, how um, uh, trust, trust in God, trust also in me. There's the Father and there's the Son. Two separate persons, but one God. It's, it's the, the, um, the, um, the confusion is brought in by the equivocation on the word God. You remember in my Shema study where I talked about MACRU, the acronym, M-A-C-R-U-E, Dr. James Anderson, who's a, a Trinitarian um, analytic theologian, he argues for a position that what we read in the Bible in both parts, Old and New Testaments, are often statements about God that are not fully explained to us, right? We have to remember that God uses language to his understanding and not always to our understanding. So God um, explains himself in mystery. God explains himself using limited terminology at times. It leads to our own misunderstanding, but it's not God's fault. It's that we have the deficiency and we must rely on God to bring us into the place and, and bridge the gap where we go from misunderstanding to uh, understanding by faith. So we talk about M-A-C-R-U-E. It's an acronym for merely an apparent contradiction resulting from unarticulated equivocation. What do we mean by unarticulated equivocation? We mean um, statements that strike us as ambiguous because of lack of detail or what I like to phrase information limitation. So sometimes the word God will show up in the Bible and it's not differentiating between God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. We don't have any statement in the Bible or, or any particular um, passage all the time where it's telling us that this is the Father or the Son or the Spirit that's in view. We have to determine from context what's going on with the term God, which is slightly um, ambiguous or equivocal, equivocal, confusing. So that's the point that's being brought up. When Jesus says, trust in God, we have to infer from context, since it's the Son speaking, that the word God there must mean trust in the Father, trust also in me. Meaning, if you trust in the Father, then you must, should also trust in the Son, because I and the Father are one. The Father and the Son are shared in their nature. And if your trust is in the Father, then you can also trust in the Son. I'm trustworthy just as much as the Father is trustworthy. Um... I came to do my Father's will, and I'm perfectly obedient to Him in every way. Therefore, whatever the Father does, whatever I see Him doing, Yeshua says, I also do. The works that He does are the works that I do. And the works that you see me doing are the works that He's doing in me. And if you trust in Him, then you should trust in me. And if you trust in me, then you should trust in Him. That's how I and the Father are one. Notice I'm, I'm, I'm um, disambiguating the word God there. Even though that's not what Yeshua said, he didn't say, trust in the Father, trust also in me. We know from context, that must be what he's talking about. <clears throat> he's not saying, trust in God and trust also in me as a human being um, who's not God. Although, actually, since Jesus was a perfectly um, 
he was a perfect human being, we could say that's true as well. But let's keep going. Uh, question eight. We're already bumping up against my time. I do want to finish this tonight. Question eight. According to the doctrine of the Trinity, the Father and Son are co-equal. If that is true, how can the Father be in any way greater than Jesus? Right? We know there are passages where the Father is greater than I. Jesus, those are Jesus' own words. Uh, the Father is greater than I. And again, this is a popular verse that non-Trinitarian um, um, uh, teachers and students like to bring up in their um, objection that Trinity is the biblical way to understand God. Again, <clears throat> this is a false assumption. And the false assumption states it this way. Trinitarian theology implies that co-equal must mean equal in every possible way. <clears throat> I'll flash a little graphic on the screen that basically explains it this way. The way in which God is one is not the same way in which God is three. We Trinitarians understand that God's oneness is um, understood to be one way, like an, in, a, in a nature way, and yet his threeness is understood to be in a personhood way. So we do believe that God is one, but we also believe that God is three. But the way in which he's one is not the same way in which he's three. So when we're talking about co-equal in God, we can say co-equal in the terms of the oneness, but not co-equal in the terms of the threeness. In terms of the oneness of God, and the nature of God, and the being of God, right, the, the what category of God, there's co-equality, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all co-equal. There's no um, hierarchy going on there. There's no greater and lesser degree of godness, if you can invent a word, when it comes to Father, Son, Holy Spirit in terms of nature. That's where we talk about co-equality. But when we turn around and look at the persons of God, again, this is a mystery to us because there's nothing like God in our that we can compare God to. God is wholly unique, right? He's altogether transcendent, and yet at the same time, he's eminent. He's far away from us because we can't fully un understand him. And yet at the same time, he's close to us. That's what I mean by the the um the paradox uh paradox of transcendence compared to eminence. The closeness and the far away both at the same time. In the co-equal category, when it comes to deity, yeah, they're all co-equal because there's one God. There's one God. He's equal to himself because he is He is the only God there is. There aren't three gods that are equal with one another. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about one God who is altogether wholly equal with only himself. There is none greater than God because there are no gods other than God. He is the solely unique God that exists. There's only one God. That's monotheism in its in its um, foundational sense of the word. But when we talk about the persons of God, again, the mystery, I can't fully understand it, but the Bible seems to, the Bible does tell me uh, or explain to me or give me enough information so that I can draw this um, uh, conclusion that the, um, uh, the hierarchy is in the personhood, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's, there's, there's hierarchy going in there. So don't, get confused. Again, it's it kind of all boils down to, again, understanding or misunderstanding uh, incarnation. Question nine, how can Jesus be like us in every way and still be 100% man, 100% God? Because we're not 100% gods. Right? Last time I checked, I'm not 100% God. I'm not, I mean, I've got God's nature in me to the extent that his Holy Spirit lives in me, but I don't have the nature of God where I'm, um, you know, I'm timeless. Uh, I, I, I don't exist outside of time and space. Um, I, you know, I'm definitely finite. I had a beginning, unlike God who had no beginning, um, right? Although I will live in eternity with God. So in that sense, he has conferred upon me a part of his nature so that I can live eternally with him, right? I now know from this point forward, I will, I will have no ending, just like God has no ending. I will go on into eternity, just like God goes on to, into eternity. But I did have a beginning, and God didn't. Plus, I have knowledge limitation. God has no knowledge limitation, Right. I have power limitations. God has no power limitations. So in that sense, it's obvious that we humans are not like God in that capacity. But look at this false assumption. Trinitarian theology, Trinitarian's theology implies that like us in every way means something more than being fully human. We are human. Jesus was human, but unlike us, Jesus has two natures. He's truly God and truly man. That's why it's the Incarnation. Question 10, we're wrapping up. If Jesus is God and God cannot be tempted, why would the devil tempt Jesus? Again, um, false assumption. First, 
This repeats the assumption of question four. Second, that Trinitarian theology implies that Satan acts according to perfect reason and was absolutely sure Jesus is God, right? We have no reason to believe Satan is like this and Trinitarians do not believe it either. So in conclusion, what we're looking at is that um, the argument and reasoning thought processes of, I'm not saying all biblical Unitarians reason this way, and I don't think this blogger is either, but he's simply trying to get us to a place where we can understand that many of the arguments do fall into this particular category of creating more or less a straw man argument against Trinitarianism that can easily be dealt with if we understand that it's a, an assumption uh, to begin with. Here are the conclusions of this particular blogger. I'll just kind of read them nonstop, and then we'll draw this study to a close and dismiss in prayer. This blogger says, as I hope this shows, much of Unitarian argumentation takes the same form and flawed strategy of atheists arguing against God, just like atheists made up criteria for good evidence for God is fallacious. Unitarians made up criteria for good scriptural evidence for Trinity is fallacious. Continuing, unlike Unitarians, thoughtful Trinitarians do not derive their theology from the broken flawed measure of their own human expectations. These expectations are not logical, and they are not logic. Trinitarianism is completely logical if we are using actual logic as a measure. There is no actual incoherence as in actual contradictions in what Trinitarians actually believe. Remember, Macru, it's merely an apparent contradiction. It's based on our flawed limitations and based on our, our exposure to certain parts of the text. For instance, if you only read the Old Testament in your understanding of God, you are going to have a, a limited, stunted, ultimately flawed view of God, and that's because you're not allowing the New Testament to complete the revelation of who God truly is and who God decided to reveal himself to be. Remember, God is the one who planned it this way. He purposely veiled his, his, his um, revelation in mystery in the Old Testament. It served his purposes. I don't understand how and why he did it that way, but there are plenty of other mysteries that God veiled in the Old Testament. We talked in our eschatology study about the mystery of Babylon and the mystery of lawlessness and the mystery of the Gentiles, right? Uh, the mystery of godliness. Um, the mystery of God. Why does God mist? Uh, why did God um, present things in mystery? Why didn't he just from the word go? Why didn't from the beginning of Genesis just explain His nature as Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Why didn't he just explain the Gentiles from the very beginning in in the book of Genesis? Why didn't he just explain the incarnation from the very beginning? Why didn't he just reveal that Antichrist was going to hit the scene in the spirit in 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 the book of Genesis? Why? 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 Well, guess what? We are not God. We didn't make the rules. We can't, we can't answer all those questions. But um, if we trust that the Bible is uh, God's authoritative uh, word given to us, and we trust the um, wisdom of God in presenting things in mystery, then we have to follow through with God's, um, what we might call, progressive revelation of himself to us. And we have to read all parts of Scripture that are relevant to discussion. And that's why Trinitarian is completely logical, because it uses God's method of explaining the, the matter, not our own flawed uh, logical pro thought processes. Let's continue. There is no actual incoherence as in actual contradictions in what the Trinity's actual, Trinitarians actually believe. The only inconsistencies Unitarians find are between what Trinitarians actually believe and what Unitarians think Trinitarians ought to believe, according to their own fallible thinking. Scripture does not contradict what Trinitarians actually believe. It only contradicts what Unitarians think Trinitarians ought to believe. And again, I might interject, uh, Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. So if in the Old Testament, God is given creative, uh, uh, um, authoritative uh, ownership, right? He is labeled as the um, undisputed creator of all things, <clears throat> right? He describes himself in the book of Isaiah, uh, particularly in the 40s chapters, as being the only God there is, and there are no other gods beside him. There are none that, that were around when he created the heavens and the earth. He knows no other gods, blah, 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 right? He gives language that gives him the exclusive rights to wear the label 
creator. And yet that's God talking in the Old Testament. By the time we read the New Testament um, passages, we find out that Yeshua is not only the agency of creation, but is very creator himself. He not only had things created through him, but they were by him. That's where the agency argument kind of falls flat for some people who say, well, Jesus is only the agent. Well, yeah, sure, if there were no, if there was no language that talked about things created, being created by him, if it was only the through him, yeah, then I could maybe think that he was he's merely an agent. But the, there are verses that talk about by him and through him, by him and through him and for him, right? All things are upheld by uh, Jesus' creative power. This means that when we're talking about um, contradictions, it's not contradictory. It's not illogical. It's simply that we have to use both parts of the Bible to fill in all of the details that we didn't see if we only read one part of the Bible. So that's what you need to do. Um, scripture does not contradict what Trinitarians actually believe. It only contradicts what Unitarians think Trinitarians ought to believe. Uh, let's continue. Generally speaking, you don't see Trinitarians making these kinds of arguments against Unitarians. Rather, Trinitarians readily accept every scriptural affirmation of humanity in Jesus while also affirming every scriptural affirmation of his deity. That's what I mean by the harmony between what seems to be a paradox, the harmony between what seems to be a mystery. It's too often the default mindset of the non-Trinitarian to say, well, either one is right and one is wrong. Either God is creator or Jesus is creator. And too often, those who are non-Trinitarians just default into the, well, it must be God is creator and Jesus is not. But that's wrong. God is creator and Jesus is creator. Why? Because Jesus is God as well. Let's close the bridge, close the gap on the paradox, close the loop as it were. Let both parts of the Bible speak to your theology. O main, O main. Let's continue. Trinitarians rarely accept every part. Trinitarian arguments typically look like walking through scriptures that directly supports their views and exegeting it, not making statements about what a hypothetical scripture should be if Unitarian theology were true. Why is this the case? This blogger supplies this answer. This is because Unitarian conclusions are wrong because they are actually based on only believing part of what scripture says. Again, Dr. James White is fond of saying Unitarians like to read the Bible with one eye closed. What he's trying to imply is that it's far too often the deficiency of Unitarian theology that doesn't accept parts of the New Testament that disagree with their own brand of Unitarian theology. So with their, they have to resort to certain uh, practices that are um, um, not recommended or in some cases are unorthodox altogether. They either question the validity of the New Testament text that's, that disagrees with their theology, or they question the source, or they question the manuscript, or they question the translation, or in some cases they just throw the verse out altogether or throw out the chapter or throw out the book, or eventually they end up throwing out the entire New Testament like um, monotheistic uh, Jews and um, um, uh, Muslims do. Let's keep reading. Let's conclude here tonight. Um, this is because Unitarian conclusions are wrong because they are actually based on only believing part of what the scripture says. Don't believe part of what the scripture says. Believe it all. That's my recommendation. Uh, this blogger says, I've stated before that the real difference between Trinitarian and Unitarian as it, Unitarians as it relates to scripture is that Trinitarians believe all of what scripture says and conclude the Trinity is true while Unitarians believe only part of what the scripture says and based on their conclusions from that, attempt to explain away those scriptures that disagree. And I might also say that this has been my experience as well. Nearly, I mean, a good chunk of Unitarian arguments that I um, address over and over again in my, um, in my experience here as a Trinitarian are based on just objections to passages that the Trinitarians, that I'm sorry, that the Unitarians disagree with because they just, it, it disagrees with their theology. And so they stand in judgment of that passage instead of the other way around, right? When you're reading the Bible, you want the Bible to stand in judgment of you so that if there's something you disagree with, then you're the one who's in error. You're the one who's wrong. You're the one who hasn't seen the bigger picture. The scripture is perfect in its original autograph. The scripture is God's revelation to us, and God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't have any deficiencies. Understand? 
All right. This similarity between atheists and Unitarians should come as no surprise, since Unitarianism and atheism both became popular at the same time in the post-Enlightenment age of reason of the 17th and 18th centuries. That's a bit of history that I didn't myself didn't, didn't understand or didn't know, wasn't aware of, but we'll take it as truth. You want to go back and fact check that on your own, you're certainly welcome to. But in conclusion, this blogger says, they speaking of Unitarianism and atheism, they are based on the same false premise that human reasoning is able to solve all of the mysteries of the world. Atheists use that worldview to deny the existence of God, while Unitarians use that same worldview to deny the deity of Christ. Either way, it comes from the same set of false assumptions leading to the same type of denial of the truth of Scripture. And we went just a little bit over like we typically do, but it was necessary in order to finish this. And so next week, um, we'll just jump right back into our Biblical Unitarian website, and we'll begin to look at, let me back up, and look at the very next verse, which is Genesis 16, 7 through 13, the angel of the Lord. And we'll begin a discussion about the angel of the Lord from a Trinitarian perspective and the angel of the Lord from a Unitarian perspective. Well, that'll do it for a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. And with that, let's close in prayer. Abba, I bless your name, and I am thankful for the truths of your word. I am so blessed to be able to have the totality of your word with me and for me to be able to research. There are times when people didn't have all of the Bible, and that didn't stop them from knowing truth, but it certainly limited their, their ability to be able to reference parts of the Bible in one section and, and compare and contrast, or not really contrast, but confirm those truths in another part of the Bible. And so we're, we're so fortunate uh, these days in this modern age to have the Bible in print, the Bible in electronic format, the Bible in audio format. Um, we've got access to the entire Bible, the original languages, um, language studies and helps and lexicons and dictionaries and concordances. We've got so many tools at our disposal. There's really no excuse for our misunderstanding what you're trying to convey to us because the canon has been closed and we don't need to suppose that there's more that needs to be uh, stated. Thank you, Lord, for your words. Thank you for your plans, which are perfect. Thank you that you're a God who's still in control. You've not relinquished your seat on the throne. And we know that we're marching quickly towards a day when your son is going to return to planet Earth and establish his kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that by your mercy and your grace and your intense love for us, that you have brought us into this position in the kingdom and that you have secured our place right next to you. Thank you for seating us in heavenly places. And we look forward to one day meeting you face to face and uh, dwelling with you in eternity. Uh, bless us, Father, in, this, in the here and now. Help us to be prepared for the times that are coming that are right around the corner. Um, continue to help us to strengthen one another. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. Bashem Yeshua. Amen. Amen.